Hey now, it's Massacre Radio, burning up the dial from stem to stern on this, the 47th episode. Welcome in, I am your host, Members Only Dave, and today we explore the world of adult films. Well, sort of anyway, as a little bit later on I'll be joined by my guest, Chris Cock, a guy who does mostly adult films, but has had somewhat of a breakthrough with one of his more recent acting roles in the film Pleasure. I'll be sure to ask him about that. Hey, if you've never seen Chris perform before, you should totally check it out. He takes it to the hole harder than Stacy Ogman and with more flair and finesse than Moses Malone. Anyway, enough of my gum flapping. Let's get to it. You know the drill. No flipping. It's Massacre Radio, baby. Yeah! You're listening to Massacre Radio. Be honest and tell us how you really feel about Massacre Radio. I fucking love it. Massacre Radio on WKMA Cleveland and HD2 Station. Hey, I gotta tell you, life's good. I, uh, vacation just started, it's a beautiful day, I'm at the beach, but there's only one problem. It's too fucking noisy around here. Pop in those earbuds, Romeo, and dial up Massacre Radio on your HD2 dial. All the summer sizzle you can handle and then some. Massacre Radio, the perfect summertime companion. Yeah! I got a problem, David. <laughs> Are you so afraid uh, of that, that that's got your mind locked up? Let me see your palm. I lost my job. Well, that's interesting. I must have missed that. New opportunities are right. The old opportunities are right. Robbed at gunpoint and you lost your job? Yeah, I was an office act designer. That's unfortunate. You poor man. I see that you spend a lot of time in the toilet. What do you mean? Reading men's magazines. That's my alternative. Suicide. Welcome back. You're listening to Massacre Radio on WKMA Cleveland and HD2 Station. Dominating the airwaves just as God intended. I want to welcome in my guest today. He's an actor with numerous acting credits under his name, like Pleasure, Interracial Gangbang, Volume 2, and Portraits of Andrea Palmer. Welcome to the program, Chris Cock. Chris, thanks for your time today on Massacre Radio, man. How's everything going for you? Hey, pretty good so far. You know, speaking of work, I just drove into Vegas, arrived at, you know, uh, 11 o'clock. My time started a shoot at 12, finished at uh, 1.30. So, uh, all good. A very efficient man from the sound of things. Um, yeah. You, you know, um, you got to be ready to give that money shot when they ask for it. So <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better myself. Well, Chris, I really don't know where to start here. So I suppose I'll start with the obvious question. Just provide us a little bit of background for those who might not be familiar. How did you first end up getting into the realm of adult films and acting in general, would you say? I actually was brought in by my then girlfriend who was a dancer. I'm not a jealous person, so I was like, whatever. And then I can't remember who approached her in the industry while she was at a strip club and was like, oh, yeah, you know, you know how they recruit girls and whatnot. And then yeah. they were like, oh, well, you know, she was like, I have a uh, my boyfriend. And, oh, they were like, oh, let's see his dick and whatever. And they were like, oh, you both should get into it. And I was like, you can do whatever you want. I'm okay. After a while, she decided she wanted to try it. You know, we would fool around with, like, her friends. She would like to, like, mess with her girlfriends and mess with me. She was like, I think it would be hot if we did it on camera for our company. And she, like, was turned on by this specific video of this one performer uh, with, like, five girls. And she said, oh, my God, that would be so hot. You, me, and four of the girls. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And I reluctantly didn't want to do it. And then, like... A month and a half later, um, I joined the industry, and I've been here since, I, is it 14 years or 15 years later? I don't know. I can't, can't remember. 2010, 2011 is when I when I got in. So, yeah. Long story short, that's how I got in the industry. Well, I asked because I always heard that if you were a dude who wanted to get into doing adult films, that you kind of had to do gay stuff first. Is there any truth to that narrative? I know there are exceptions to every rule, but is there any validity, do you think? Is that still a thing, or was it mostly an urban legend, the whole gay stuff thing? You you know what? I can't speak for myself, and I don't want to, like, you know, uh, ill. I mean, it's not bad speaking bad of the industry, but... 
Yeah, there were times that this was before the internet could, you know, backtrace your new name with your old name. You'll go on and be privy to find a lot of male porn stars did, in fact, I don't know if they were, you know, approached and said, hey, you were hot and, you know, this would be great look for you. You know what I mean? In every mm-hmm. urban legend, there's some truth. Right. You know what I mean? So every lie, there's some truth within that lie. So that story, I know some performers that, you know, they don't speak about it. But if you search your name and you dig enough, you'll see that they did do some gay porn prior to their straight porn. No, that makes sense to me. And you kind of mentioned something there, which kind of leads me into my next question here. You said you've been doing this for about 14 years or so, the whole adult film and acting thing. So what would you say, Chris, you would attribute to your staying power in the industry? Because in my feeble little mind, it seems like any guy can do the porn thing, right? So for you, what would you say is your thing that keeps you so relevant and viable within the industry? Um, Well, for one, as with anything, I'm my own product. You're your own product how you maintain and stay is you me for me particularly i had to find a way to be myself the chris that people meet is my true personality i don't have a porn persona mm-hmm. because i need to be genuine to me of course there's some roles where i act and like i i you know they the certain companies call for a certain thing but the w- jokes i crack you know i work with companies that allow me to be me let me be funny let me just say out the wall stuff where normally guys don't talk during porn i don't like that because when they're in like group scenes or whatever and it's quiet it gets creepy like if there's like two guys and one girl or three guys and one and everybody's just like you know what I mean? Right. Like, like that, that's just weird to me. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's just weird. But, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it is like, you, you, of course, you sell your personality, you do what you do. But the other thing is, the second part of that is, it's not something everybody can do. They can't just get new guys to do it because um, everybody, if it was that easy, everybody would do it. Got you. Like I said, you have to be able to come on command basically like they'll be like okay they'll give you a signal and tell you all right we're ready for the pop and then you know they can't wait another 15 30 minutes for you to pop you have to like pop within a reasonable amount of time to get the shot in in the scene Mm -hmm. also there's got to be the recovery time like it uh, it happens sometimes you pop early you can't be flaccid afterwards you know what i mean like with your like being an athlete you learn your body and your abilities, and then I've been able to pop more than once in a scene or within a a lot of amount of time if necessary, not just for myself, but if somebody else wasn't able to, uh, we help each other out of the scene by giving them more time by creating more activity until until then, when Mm -hmm. you're working in group scenes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And the uh, third part of that is you have to be liked by the female talent because it's easy to go on someone's no list. And once you go on that no list, it's very hard to get off of it. And then girls talk. You got to pick up on that stuff pretty pretty quickly unless they're just going to try to make you the it guy. Because being, um, Mm -hmm. it's not a trope. I'm not complaining. But being an interracial guy, uh, being an ethnic black guy in the porn, it's a little bit harder than than a white guy getting in the industry. Because everybody, if I were to ask you, say, hey, what do you think interracial is? What would your answer be? Uh, let's see. It would be a black guy with a white girl or really even a black guy with like a an Asian or Japanese or Scandinavian even. I don't know. Okay. Now, to clarify that, do you, what, I, what I'm leading to is you said it in porn, it's a black guy with any other race. But in, in real world, interracial is white and Asian, white and Hispanic. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that yeah. that's in the race. Of. I understand. But in porn it's not. It's literally just black guy and whatever or something more often than not they don't really shoot that much, but black girl and whatever. Okay. So there there's a lot of there's a lot of issues with that which um we kinda tackled in one movie that uh, I did that brought up the, the issue of that that's been a long standing thing. A lot of people may not have known the um blurred racial lines that are within porn considering what we do is sex type thing. So, yeah. Actor Chris Cock is my guest today on Massacre Radio. Okay, so I want to know about the camaraderie on the sets of these adult shoots that you do. I'm looking at a title like 
interracial gangbang tryouts. And I'm guessing with a title like that, Chris, you're obviously not the only guy in the scene. So just talk about, in general, the camaraderie on the sets. Are you guys, like, mostly friends off screen too? Are you, like, high-fiving and forming interpersonal relationships? Or is it strictly business, pop and go? No, no, no. I mean, we're we're all a close-knit family, you know what I mean? Like, within the industry, we all know each other. You know, I mean, just like high school, there's clicks. Everybody's in the same grade, and there's clicks, of course. But on set, I've been fortunate. The sets that I've been on with the directors that I work with, because I basically choose who I want to work with, like director-wise, and then I've been able to um, build and cultivate a team of guys that I really enjoy working with. When it comes to scenes like that, generally everybody gets along with each other because we know the scene's not going to look well if we don't. I mean, occasionally you'll get upset and then some sets, the guys try to outdo each other. Everyone's trying to, you know, do their thing. Me and the guys I know, we're just like, hey, they need X amount of footage. Let's just rotate this and make this go more smoothly instead of one guy trying to be like, yeah, beat the shit up, beat the shit up. You know what I mean? Excuse my language. Um, as as like like the scene I did like for Cream Piles, you know what I mean, um, from Asiana Studios that we just began and started. That just launched in October, um, creampiles.com. Those guys, I named us, I dubbed us the Cream Team. Guys like Scotty P, Jack Black, Jackson Briggs. Like we, we have a camaraderie to where we have jerseys with our names on it, representing. So um, that, that lets you know that we really do look out for each other when we're on set and off set, you know what I mean? Like sometimes we get together, we'll go to like the karaoke or we'll like go grab something to eat or we'll do other stuff because we've all been in the industry for mm-hmm. so long, you know what I mean? Like you build your work friends relationship, you know what I mean? It's not right. how I show up and leave. But there can be some sets where you're like, Dude, all right, cool. Let me just get get in and get out. Like that's it. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there's some people that go in and do it, but me, I'm fortunate to work with uh, likes of like all these directors mm-hmm. that have been in the game for a long time that respect us just as well. And does then don't treat us just like we're a stunt cock. They realize the guys actually help direct the girls because we have to position the girl. So we get the angles that the director or the cameraman needs because they can't talk during the scene. So, and then at the end, we high elbow. We very rarely high five, but we high elbow. High elbow or, or, for, or forearm, forearm touching because, you know, everybody's done, you know, touch their manhood and stuff like that. So, right. so we, we have little, little intricate scenes where we all interact with each other and stuff like that on the head on side. So, yeah. How about the slang? Are there any words or phrases that might take on a different meaning when used on the set of a triple X scene? You know, for example, here in radio, we call headphones cans, and we have phrases like hitting the post. Are there any similar examples you can think of as it relates to what you do, Chris? Oh, damn. You know what? That's an interesting question. I mean, we're pretty straightforward. Like, it's more like personal, like, per person's verbiage type thing. You know what I mean? Like, I have one I, I call the no stroke, and then like people that know me, they were like, "Oh, Chris, give her the no stroke," okay. and then they give them the no stroke. So it's kind of <laughs> like I, I, you you put the ticket, but you have to. I don't know. Like some girls, this is not a brag. This is just something I found out. I don't know if it works every time, but um, I've done it enough to where it's seen on camera. Where you'll see I've stopped fucking, and then I stop moving, and I give them a no stroke, and the girl has an orgasm. Right. It's the weirdest thing. How about this? I've always wanted to know about the performance-enhancing drugs on the set of these shoots. What are the attitudes towards that? And do you or any of the guys you know or have worked with in various scenes use any performance-enhancing drugs to get things a little more rigid, should I say? Uh, I want everybody listening to understand. Well, performance-enhancing drugs, whatever, um, they're not an end-all, be-all. They're not a porno pill dick or porno dick pill. You can take one. And it's still not work because it's still all mental. Like if your mind's not in there or you're distracted, it's not going to work. Doesn't mean it matter how many you can take or you can take a lot and end up with a severe headache. But when I got in, nobody really talked about them using it because I went, went natural. And then like directors would look at you and be like, okay, oh, you're not ready. And I'm like, well, shit, you just said action. Like what the fuck is going on? Like, I, you know what I mean? Like right. I need a little right. interaction. I need like the girl, like, I don't need them to touch me. I don't need to fuck, but I need 
build up, you know, like, hey, what's up, love her body, look at her or talk or whatever. But apparently people do take do take take them. They take them just as a fail safe. Most people have one that they bring a set just in case. There's one thing called the Caverjack where people inject their dicks, uh, which has become become a big thing. I don't do that. I don't. I occasionally take something that's if I'm in a, a large scene where I'm not going to have stimulation on the regular. And then when it comes to my turn, I want a little bit of an edge to help me. Mm-hmm. But that's more like when there's a scene of like eight guys or some weird thing or like where I'm going to have a lot of downtime or stuff like that. So it all depends on the scene. But in uh, Europe, like they all do crazy sex shit, but um, apparently a lot like the, the, it's part of the regiment people do out there is shoot their dicks up. There's wow. too many side effects for me to ever think about doing that on top of, I don't like needles anywhere near my genitals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm like, Oh, you got to give it to yourself. Oh, you got to stick it here. I'm like, yo, and then like it creates scar tissue and whatever. I don't know. There's a bunch of shit I read up on it. Not that I read up on it to do it, just to read up on it right. for the role that role that I did. Because when they asked me to do it, I was like, I ain't doing that. And I was like, you know what? I respect it. I'm not. There's not really a needle in it. It's, we're we're gonna act like it. I'm like, okay, cool. It's not a problem. But yeah. So to answer your question, long story short, uh, yeah, it's done. People have it, and if they need it, they need it. You know what I mean? Like it's right. it's not it's not a taboo thing. It's just part of the job. You know what I mean? Like it's not not a it's not like a baseball player taking steroids. Right. It doesn't enhance you. It just helps you reach the blood flow. It just opens up the blood. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you're drinking enough yeah. water and doing your own, you can take a supplement that does the same thing. This that just does it a lot quicker. So. Now, uh, this next question, I can't help but ask about porn bloopers in general. In your experience, Chris, and being on set and shooting these films, what are some of the more wild things you've seen firsthand or been a part of while shooting a scene? What are some things that might have gone wrong, maybe even? Um, I mean, uh, the biggest blooper is back to dinner pooper. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh. I mean, it is kind of funny, but i got to maintain some poise here, so... Uh, when that happens, how does that change the vibe of the room? How do things proceed from there, I guess? I mean, can someone really bounce back from that is what I'm asking? I mean, I've never been on the set to where, it, like, it. everyone's, like, I think I've been on it one time where it happened. It wasn't like the whole thing went in, the girl, whatever. It was just, like, the tip went in, and she, like, jumped up. And then there was, like, oh, you know, it wasn't intentional. Mm-hmm. And then they laughed at it, you know what I mean, like, uh, it wasn't like it was a girl that never did anal. It just wasn't an anal day for her. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, that that's the blooper I saw that was weird, blooper in the pooper. Um, <laughs> the other ones, there, there's, not, there's no weird bloopers other than us laughing or, like, the girl that queefed and thought she farted. <laughs> yeah. She never queefed. Or she, she like, like, during sex and changing positions. She, like, got embarrassed and was like, oh, my God, I got to go. And went to the bathroom like, what happened? She's like, oh, I'm sorry, I farted. And we're like, well, you didn't fart. <laughs> yes, I did. It was like, no, you didn't. That was just a queef. Like, what? And you're like, oh, you know, a new girl that's never had sex or had that happen. You know right. what I mean? Like, a lot of girls and a lot of guys find out more about their body and their functions of it in porn. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. And then uh, the major blooper that's always funny the girl squirts and it gets on the cameraman or the cameraman jumps out, out the way while trying to maintain the shot. That's always funny. Um, today, the girl got a cream pie and then she had the other girl push it back in and they're like, yeah, push it back out. And then like uh, uh, like a teardrop of uh, uh, money shot, shot back <laughs> towards the camera <laughs> and you just see in slow motion <laughs> the camera guy uh, kind of like I were landed. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, so... Well, hang on. You just mentioned squirt, and there's been a lot of online discourse over whether or not squirt is pee or not, or if it's a real thing, all to its own. I've always thought it was just pee, but Chris, what's your take on the whole squirt versus pee thing, and how does it taste? I'm going to tell you, they're, they're outside of porn, when I made a girl squirt for the first time, she didn't know what was going on. It wasn't pee. It had a musky smell, but not an ammonia smell. Okay. Um... I'm pretty sure it might be part pee, but it, it, it's not pee. Sometimes girls that say they can squirt, they're really peeing. Then there are girl, then there are girls that can really squirt. Like it's kind of like, you know what I mean? Like right. 
you know a pea stream when you see a pea stream and then like a squirt is a little bit different. Like I've had a girl, she's like, Oh, I squirt and then like it comes out and it's yellow and I'm like, No, that that that's pea. <laughs> Like, no, 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 that's pee. Right. Because the girls that, that squirt, it takes a lot out of them because what it is is they'll hydrate themselves. And then, like, I've seen girls, like, squirt, right? They'll get fucked. And then it's kind of like when we're, when we're fucking as guys, you can't pee and nut at the same time. Right. You can't. You just can't. You don't know which one it is, so you stop. And if it's, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. there's no way to pee and nut at the same time. Right. Um, or one after you, you can't pee and then bust a nut or you can't bust a nut then pee. Like it, it doesn't work. So in the same fashion with the girls, the, uh, I've seen a girl squirt and then two minutes later they squirt again. Mm-hmm. And then two minutes later they're squirting again. And maybe even 30 seconds later they're squirting again. And it's a lot of squirt. And I'm like, okay, they know, they know what to do to get them the, themselves there. I'm, that's why they maintain the fluid because they are expeding fluid. But nobody can pee that much back to back. You know what I mean? Like, like they're not pinching it off. So, so you know, for like about a words or whatever girls do, they're not pinching it off and then holding it and then releasing it two minutes later. They're, you know, you get what I'm saying? Like once yeah. once anybody breaks the seal to pee, you can't stop yourself from peeing. It's all coming without out. completing your pee. You know, it's all coming out. <laughs> Chris Cock is my guest today on Massacre Radio, a man who has starred in over 100 triple X scenes, so he's quite the swordsman. Chris, another acting credit of yours I see here is in a film called Wet Food 8. Now, I mentioned that specifically because I previously discussed Wet Food 9 with friend of the show Steve Catani and just how insane that one looked. I mean, I don't know what they did in Wet Food 8, but the banner for number 9 just had this chick with milk and cereal poured in her ass or something. I'm assuming you agree or disagree before getting on set as to some of the things that you are willing to do but just talk about some of the more extreme things that you've seen or been a part of on set that made you step back and think really hey this is actually kind of crazy guys um the craziest thing i've seen on set that i did not expect that i didn't know what was going on was this guy that got kicked in the balls like he's that was his thing and then he got kicked in the balls all of a sudden and like i didn't know it was coming and I was like, fuck, that fucking hurt. Like, like, why did she do this? You know what I mean? Like, and this was early on in my career. But he, like, went down, and then he and all of a sudden he popped up, and he was like, okay, cool, that was perfect. We're going to do it again, but I'm going to capture it from a different angle. And I was like, yo, what the fuck is going on? I'm like, my, like that made my dick hurt. Um, uh, but, like, wild, wild, wild. I mean, Adriana Chet took one scene, you know what I mean, like, being as wild and great and a terrific person as she is, um, taking uh, my first time seeing two dicks in the ass, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. uh, try to do try to do three. Like that was just stuff that wasn't done um, wow, out three. here. Uh, uh, yeah, three. Yeah, like she's phenomenal. Like yeah, but the, it's all in the taste of what they're shooting. You know what I mean? Like, but I wasn't a part of that shoot. I just saw it. Chris, I mentioned your film credits, Portraits of Andrea Palmer and Pleasure, which we'll get to here in a minute, but when you're doing an adult scene or a hardcore scene, in your mind, is there a difference between acting and performing, or is it one and the same to you, would you say? Um, in general, yeah, there there is a difference because you have to um, um, put forth a different energy, but be mindful because in, in, in a normal movie like Pleasure, you got to shoot it like three or four different angles. Like, you know what I mean? They're like, okay, do it again. Okay, do it again. So it, uh-huh. it's a little different. Sometimes in porn, depending on the, if you're shooting a feature, they might do the same thing. But most of the time, porn is just shot all the way through one time. No cuts, no takes, unless somebody needs to take a break or there's a mess up. Uh, with a- Andrea Palmer, because that film was shot on film and not digital media, we had to like act it out before we filmed it because we couldn't film over it. And all of them all together, I look at them the same because I'm portraying a persona for that scene with that particular girl, even if I've worked with that girl before. So for me, the, I treat them all the same. Like, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm, I'm putting uh, Chris on camera, and I need to be the best I can because before all this, I was a dance teacher. I did entertainment and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. uh, everything everything is a performance to me. Everything is a dance. Uh, I I treat them the same, but. Porn is a little bit more stressful because you, you can't work hard unless you're hard. 
Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to a few more things here, Chris. It says here that you are fluent in Japanese and work extensively in the Japanese adult video industry. What would you say you enjoy most about working in JAV? I mean, don't they have wild restrictions on porn over there, or am I thinking of China? No, no, no. Um, Japan's restriction is it has to be mosaic. It has to be pixelated and whatever. But I, I just resonate with, like, their porn because it costs so much in post to edit and hide and blur out. Mm-hmm. Like, theirs is more focused on uh, telling the story. You, you don't, the, you don't, they don't have to get naked so quickly. The interaction on set, even though in, in Japan, the male talent is not allowed to, inter- like, talk with the female talent. Well, so that's the one good thing here in America. Um, but just on set, I, like, I, I, know, I have fun on set here. But over there, it could be because it's a new experience or, you know, I was into the culture before before porn. I'm not like, I don't have like, quote unquote, yellow fever or whatever. It's like I really am studying the language and I, I go over there and I'm fortunate. My significant other is really big over there. And as people found out who I was dating, it didn't. Right, like it just opened up more doors because they were like, oh, because everybody knew of her and wanted to meet her and talk to her. That it just, I don't know, just the way they are on set, not them, just the way the industry, not they, but the industry is over there. When on set, the stories, the interaction is kind of passionate. Instead of like, hurry up and get naked and blah, 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 like all that right. shit, I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, 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 it builds an interesting story. Like I said, like a choreographer, you're building the song and dance instead of getting straight to the finale. There's a build up to it. Like, mm-hmm. porn has a build up, but it's literally like, guy comes in, girl sees guy, oh, okay, and you know, two minutes later, he's naked. You know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, they're fucking within seven minutes. You know what I mean? If you watch Japanese porn, it's there. They're not getting completely naked. There's like, you know, they'll do like a 30 minute interview that's part of a two hour scene for a girl and walk around. Like when they come to, when they come to America, we find a spot, we get a girl, we kind of like interview them. We'll take them to like a golf course and create a whole storyline around how we're meeting them and why we're meeting them and whatever. There's one I did that's called Time Stop where I have a magical stopwatch that stops time. And then we turn around and, like, I can fuck around with girls and then put them in the position and then on stop okay. time. And they're like, what the fuck happened? You know what I mean? So, you know, it's just more creative and more engaging than just, you know, the same thing. Like, if you look at the Japanese titles for movies, just like their uh, animes, it's a long-ass name that literally would be girl with red hair goes to Vegas and meets three random guys and has, like, like I'm like, wow, that's a long title. But you know what? <laughs> That's really dope. You know what you're getting. (laughs) Right. As I've mentioned before, Chris, that aside from appearing in all these triple X flicks, you were also in the films Portraits of Andrea Palmer and Pleasure. I want to ask you about Portraits of Andrea Palmer first, where you played the role of Coke Chain and you appear in a key gangbang scene. You originally weren't cast in the flick, but rather you got recommended by Katrina Zova, whom you had known prior. Just talk a little bit about the experience of replacing someone who dropped out and the whole whirlwind that must have been for you, being on set and just kind of being thrust into that role. Um, I mean, when I was approached by it, I was just like, oh, you know, Katrina, she's super awesome people. I worked with her uh, a handful of times before that, and her energy was just, you made you want to be a part of having fun. Like, those, those are the times they're like, hey, you know, there's a role, can you do this? I'm like, hey, you know what, the experience is great. I'm up for the experience, Let, let's try this, you know. I hadn't done a film, you know, sex-related, porn-related that was going to be released on the DVD that wasn't, like, a porn. When they put me in, like, uh, you put me in a role, I will embody what I need to be for that role. I have an interesting note here, Chris, that it says, uh, aside from the key gangbang scene that you also assisted with the special effects death scene in the end, how or in what ways did you assist, and what can you tell us about your special effects background? I mean, I'm assuming you put that on your resume. Oh, well, you know, uh, aside from, like, my own special things, that was kind of <laughs> unique and different where, you know, I'm on set. That was really creative. I just remember that as you told me about it. I'm like, oh, shoot, wait, pushing the guts through while she was slicing through and making sure it didn't look too fake. Mm-hmm. And, again, like I said, we didn't have multiple takes to do this. So it was, like, another thing to be nervous at. Like, I'm like, oh, okay. 
it was uh, very lucky that, you know, Lewis took a chance and her recommendation and having me on it. Wrapping things up with my guest today on Massacre Radio, actor Chris Cock. Chris, I know we're kind of going over on time here, but just a few more questions. I wanted to ask you about the film Pleasure, directed by Ninja Thyberg, which you were also in, where you played the role of Bear. I mean, for those who haven't seen it, it was highly praised for its raw and unflinching portrayal of the adult industry. So since, of course, you work in the adult industry, talk a little bit about being a part of a film with that kind of a buzz and the kind of a success Pleasure got and what it was like working with Ninja. Ninja is innovative, intelligent. Uh, That experience was phenomenal. We didn't know it was going to get the reaction that it did. That movie took six years to finish. A24 picked it up first, and then they decided they didn't want to do it. Then Neon Raider picked it up and distributed it, put it out in theaters, and people are going to see, you know, to see yourself on the big screen like that was like cool to see yourself in a uh, DVD uh, portrait of Andrea Palmer and then uh, DVD like that. It was just like, yo, like porn's great, but like, wow, like not everybody could say they've done this and done this. And actually, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it was cool to yeah. have a little viewing party of Andrea Palmer and then have a viewing party of that. But I, I, I can't say enough about it. I like when she gave me the script, I didn't know my role was as big as it was. I didn't really, I read the script, but I didn't know Bear's influence on Bella. Like, Overall, like I, I knew my parts, and then I read the other parts of the script, and then um, being on set with the Swedish crew mixed with the LA film crew and mixed the set with porn crew because again, everybody in the movie was a porn performer except for Bella, mm-hmm. uh, Sophia. So that was interesting for everything, and everybody, you know, had a different look. It was a conversation starter about consent. That's what the movie was basically about, and it all goes back to um, portraits of Andrea Palmer, like that showed me like I knew I was creative I knew I could do it but that was like oh then I saw it on DVD I was like oh wow this would be cool to do if people give gave gave me more of a chance to do it Chris I don't mean to get too serious on you before we get you out of here but it does say here that you are an advocate for better portrayal of male adult film actors in mainstream films and that you believe that male models deserve greater recognition and depth in their roles uh Chris, how or in what ways do you think that could be achieved, would you say? Oh, God, I think a little bit more research into the topic when uh, instead of someone's opinion. I get everybody wants to put their, you know, creativity. I'm not trying to stipend it, but Mm -hmm. just a little bit more, like, care into it. Because, like I said um, at that one time, like, you know, people are going to walk away and it's either going to further push their opinion because I did lose one friend because I'm in porn and all out of all my friends, the look that I get when people first have an opinion about porn, male porn stars, Mm -hmm. then they meet me and then they are like, Oh, you know what? I see. It's not really like that. You know what I mean? So I, I guess just with anything, anybody has a negative image. If you have the power to change it for a little bit, you know, just do that. You know what I mean? Like we don't want everybody thinking bad about one group when they've never interacted with those people. So I guess get the people that know the part to play the part, basically. I mean, now that you mention it and put it that way, it makes too much sense. Chris, I know the listeners can find you on Instagram at Chris Cock with an underscore at the end there, but where else can the good folks at home find you and your videos? Um, right now they see me out. I love that I'm not everywhere. I don't, I don't do the black and orange channel. Um, they have to literally go to the direct sites that I'm on, uh, creampile.com, uh, dark Art network, two one whole, uh, all the various ones. If you follow me on my Twitter, I, I tag and post them all the time. Uh, Twitter's the same as my Instagram, Chris Cock underscore. And then um, my website, Chris Cox Show, will be coming soon. Uh, I just took some time to make sure I, I was going to put out um, quality content for my fans. I was never in a rush to just put out content just to put out content. Yeah, they can stay tuned there. My other one was Coopers and Cuties, C-O-O-P-E-R-S-N-C-U-T-I-E-S. Uh, that was when I was doing my um, – I'm a Mini Cooper fan, so it was all uh, Mini Coopers right. before I got started. So <laughs> – yeah, there, there's some places, but I do a lot of stuff on uh, YouTube with Marika Hase at her channel, Marika Hase Official YouTube. I don't know, just type type in 
Oh, yeah. Marika Hase official. Chris, thank you so much for your time today on Massacre Radio and rising to the occasion. Hey, maybe we'll see you in Wet Food 10. How about it? All right, no problem. Thank you for having me. Hey, you take care. Massacre Radio. Hey, thanks again to my guest today, Chris Cock, for joining me. Chris was great, and don't forget that Portraits of Andrea Palmer is available now on Blu-ray by Massacre Video. That's right. Anyway, that about does it for this week's installment of Massacre Radio. Join me on the next show as we continue to just roll along. As always, I've been your host, Members Only Dave, and I'll talk at you next week. What the fuck is going on? I'm like, like that made my dick hurt. <laughs>